This morning's scripture will be found in the book of Mark, chapter 14. I'll be reading verses 22 through verses 26. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. How many of you went on a road trip this summer? It could have been a road trip that's not very far. It could have been a road trip that was extremely far. This summer we planned a trip to Yellowstone National Park with our family. This was one of our bucket lists. We've got to take the kids to Yellowstone. We planned that we would drive roughly 3,000 miles, go across six different states. We had a great time. Our route took us through Grand Teton National Park. We stayed a night in Jackson, Wyoming. And it was in Jackson, Wyoming that we began to see the first signs to Yellowstone. You know, Yellowstone was the destination, not Grand Tetons. And as we saw that sign to Yellowstone, my heart began to beat faster. You know, we are almost there. Now, imagine what it would have been like if at the sighting of the first sign to Yellowstone National Park, if we would have stopped the car and said, okay, kids, road trip's over. You know, there's the sign. There it is. Let's turn around and you know, drive another 14 hours back home. They, the uh, teenagers might have been happy with that, you know, thank God it's over. The rest of us would have been disappointed. Road signs point you in the direction of the ultimate destination. At the same time, they are not the destination. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Last week as we looked at Passover and Jesus' celebration of Passover, it's important for us to realize that Passover in the Old Testament is not the true and ultimate reality of God's deliverance. It's kind of like a road sign. It is pointing to something else. Let me say it differently. It's pointing to someone else. It's pointing to the once and for all sacrifice that Christ makes For his people. All of the Old Testament institutions are signs that point to the ultimate reality in Christ. As Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper on the night of Passover, he is showing his followers the fulfillment of God's plan of redemption. And so the Lord's Supper is designed to do two things for us believers. It is designed to point backward, we'll call this the already, at what Christ has done. It's designed to point forward to what Christ will do when he comes in glory. Now this morning we're going to spend most of our time pointing backward. And we'll spend a little bit of time pointing forward. If you think about God's movement in redemptive history, really the The climax of his movement in redemptive history has really already happened. Christ has come. What else is there for God to do? Well, to come again. That's all. And so you can understand, I hope, why most of our time today we'll be speaking about the already what God has done in Christ. We'll spend just a little bit of time about what God will do when Christ comes again in glory. So we'll divide our scripture roughly, well, not in half, but we'll do it like this. We'll talk about the already, Mark 14, verses 22 to 24. And I'm also going to use 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 25 to talk about the already. And then we'll talk about the not yet. We'll do that in Mark 14, verses 25 and 26, and 1 Corinthians 11, 26. All right, let's talk about the already for a bit. And I'll read verse, 20, uh, verse 22 to 24 one more time. And as they were eating, now the question would be eating what? Answer, Passover. 
As they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, it's a command, take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Again, Jesus is eating Passover with his disciples. Last week when we talked about Passover and Jesus spreading those elements out, at the same time he told his disciples, one of you will betray me. And remember, all of them went around the table and they all said basically the same thing. It was a question that was anticipating hopefully the negative answer from Christ. Is it I? Is it I? This we could say, is a type of examination. They were looking at their lives. They were looking in, and they were asking, Lord, am I guilty of sin against you? Now, the truth is that before that night was over, not just Judas, but all of the rest of the disciples would abandon Christ. They will all need to repent. They will all need reconciliation, redemption. They will all need to be reinstated by Christ. None of us are perfect when we come to the, to the Lord's table. And that is true. Each one of us is a work in progress, and God allows us by His grace an opportunity to look in, to examine, to repent. And our Lord is more than gracious to us. As we look in, he offers us grace again. Paul writes about the need for examination in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 to 29. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, now we're going to talk about that for a bit, what is an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. How many times have you read 1 Corinthians 11 in preparation for the Lord's Supper and asked this, am I taking this in a worthy manner? That's the question that we should, that we should be asking. Let me set it within the context of the church of Corinth. The church of Corinth, Paul was dealing with multiple divisions. There were those in Corinth that would kind of congregate in little cliques. They were the cliques of the haves and have-nots. Or we could say some had made church into small social club gatherings. And so when they would gather together for the Lord's Supper, those that were the haves, they would get together first. and They would have a full-blown meal. You know, they would drink as much wine as they wanted. Some were even getting a little bit tipsy. I know we pass out grape juice, not wine, so there's no problem with that in our church. No. They were focusing on themselves. They were not focusing on the sacrifice of Christ. Paul is encouraging them, you've got to examine yourself. You've got to eat and drink in light of the body, the body of Christ. So we come to the Lord's table. Are we doing this in a spirit of love for our brothers and sisters in Christ? Am I doing this in a way in which I would say, dear God, I need grace. I need it. Not looking around saying, oh, you know so-and-so. They need a lot of, no. What about you? If we come to the table flippantly, then we eat and drink judgment on ourselves. So we are to approach the table in a manner that thinks of the body of Christ as a whole and the sacrifice of Christ. Did you notice that Jesus commands, take, eat? It's a command. Now, there are some that go to church, I think, every Sunday. And when the elements of the Lord's Supper are passed out, they abstain. They kind of hold their hands up and they say, I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to eat it. And they might kind of, you know, do that in the chair. Why do they do that? 
Well, on the one hand, one might abstain if the problem is internal. In other words, if they examine themselves and they realize, man, there, there, there is a perpetual and ongoing sin in me that the Holy Spirit hasn't cut out like cancer yet. If the problem's internal, then let the plate pass you by. But you should never be content with that. You've got to get right with God. So as we look within and we say, Lord, there's a cancer in my heart, we should also say, Lord, cut it out, whatever the cost. Make me clean. Make me whole in your sight. Now, there are others that abstain. Again, they'll do this, and they'll say, the problem is not here. The problem is all of you, right? They'll say, the church is the problem. I'm the only perfect one here. Everybody else is sinful, therefore I'm not going to join with you sinners. <laughs> well, to that response, I would say, find another church. <laughs> find one where there are all perfect people and no sinners. You know what's going to happen? That person's going to look and look and look and look and look, and they're going to end up worshiping by themselves, and they'll still be a sinner when they do that. J.C. Ryle, uh, 19th century theologian and pastor, wrote this, as long as we so stay away, we are disobeying a plain command of Christ and living in sin. As long as we stay away, we're disobeying Christ. Christ commanded us, take it, eat it. Why? Because He wants us to remember Himself. He wants us to be connected as a body, focused in one direction on Him. There's another way to think about the self-examination that happens during the Lord's Supper. Judas is present with the other 11 apostles. We might make an observation from that that within the church there will always be believers and non-believers. The presence of Judas indicates that there's always a mixed group every time. The nature of the church until Christ comes again is that there will be believers that come together with non-believers. My question is, why would a non-believer want to take the Lord's Supper? Have you ever asked that? Now, I don't think the answer is the bread is just delicious and the wine, or grape juice in our case, is just ugh, the best. That's not why they want to come to the table. Perhaps the answer is that sometimes non-believers just want to fit in somewhere. So they come to the church and they think, well, maybe, maybe my life doesn't have to change. My heart doesn't have to change. And these people are nice people. They'll still like me anyway. So they come with an attempt just to maybe fit in. I think another group that might not believe also come to the table in an effort to deceive themselves. You see, there's one large group out there that believes this, that if you do not take the Lord's Supper in the context of just the right church, that you're going to hell. And so some people will come to the Lord's table simply for fire insurance. You know, it, it, it's not that I want my life changed. It's not that I really love God. I just don't want to burn in hell. So if that little cup of juice and that, you know, wafer of bread is going to protect me from hell, by golly, I'll take my fire insurance as often as you give it to me. While they were eating Passover, Jesus shares the meal. Now, over the last couple of weeks, I've spent quite a bit of time reading in Jewish literature, as well as, you know, God's inspired word about Passover and about the Lord's Supper. The rabbis had developed a rather extensive ritual relating to Passover. One of the problems, however, 
is that if you look for every single element that the Jewish rabbis developed relating to Passover, you're not going to find it in the biblical text. Do you know that? Now, why am I telling you this? Well, I'm telling you this because the same scholars that are look for, looking for all the rabbinic elements, when they look at Jesus' celebration of the Passover, they're looking for a checklist. Does he do this, 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 and that? And if he doesn't do all the checklists, then they say, well, it's not Passover. It's got to be something else, but it's not Passover. The meal is far it's too simplistic for them. I, I, I think there's a better option. I think Jesus is celebrating Passover, but he's doing something with this. He's showing that there's continuity with the Old Testament. The God who saves in the Old is the God who saves now, yet in a far greater way. But he's also showing discontinuity. Something changes from the coming of God putting on flesh. Something's different. This is not just like the old covenant here. This is different. Jesus will say in verse 22, the end of the verse, and in verse 23, this is my body. This is my blood. Now, the Passover feast, they didn't do that, did they? They didn't break a lamb and say, oh, this is the body of God. No. This is different. Jesus symbolically communicates that the bread that he breaks and passes around signifies his body, his sacrifice given for us. Now, I probably don't need to tell you this, but there have been a lot of ink spilled throughout the history of the church on that very small phrase, this is my body, this is my blood. Roman Catholic theologians believe that when the priest presides over the elements, that there's something mysterious that happens whereby the wine literally becomes the blood of Christ, whereby the bread literally becomes the flesh of Christ. And if you've been to a mass, you, you know what I'm talking about. The priest will turn his back to the congregation. He will look at Christ on the cross, which is typically right in the center. He'll raise his hands to heaven, and in that action... They would say, the elements literally become what they are not. Now, my question is, would the disciples have understood it that way on the night that Jesus was betrayed, on the night that he celebrated this meal? When he holds up bread and says, this is my body, would they have said, oh, well, it's got, it's got to be the flesh of Jesus? What about the cup? When he takes the cup and he says, he holds the cup up and he says, this is my blood, he's pointing at a cup. Are we to infer from that that the cup, whatever it was made out of, you know, wood, some sort of precious metal, that that wood or that metal instantly becomes blood? You kind of see the point I'm getting at? Seems like a strange invention to me. Another reality that we must consider is that Christ has only sacrificed once for sin, not over and over and over again. The Old Testament system was like that, wasn't it? The priest would get together every year. The Day of the Atonement, every year. He was sacrificed for the sin of the people. And it happened perpetually. Why? Because you've got a perpetually sinful people. You've got a perpetually sinful priest who's got to offer year after year for his own sin and then for the sin of the people. There was perpetual need, but not with Christ. There's a difference. He sacrificed only once. Infinite God satisfying the infinite wrath of God for the people of God. I think that's great news. So if you haven't kind of figured out where my view is on this, I would say that Christ's words are symbolic in nature. They're representative in nature. Christ is spiritually present with his people when they gather for worship, when they focus on what he has done for them. The meal signifies as well 
that we're never going back to the old covenant forms. Think about that. The writer of Hebrews tells us there was a problem with the old covenant. What was the problem? The problem is the sinfulness of man. This meal celebrates. We're never going back to that. There's no need to sacrifice anything beyond the infinite God-man. Verse 23, you'll probably note that Jesus says thanks over the meal. He gave thanks over the meal. The verb here is Eucharistio. We get from it a transliteration, Eucharist. So there are some that call the Lord's Supper Eucharist. And why do they do that? Well, they're just, it's a transliteration of the, of the Greek verb. The meal will go by other names in Scripture. The book of Acts, they'll break bread and they'll do that daily. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it'll be called the table of the Lord. It'll be called communion. 1 Corinthians 11, it'll be called the Lord's Supper. I also think it's important that he's taking one cup, notice 23, and he took a cup, singular. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. Typical Passover meal would have four cups of wine, we think, not, not one. Why is there a focus on this one cup? I think the one cup perhaps points to the unity that is in Christ. All of the people of God are united in Christ. Would you agree with that? That's right. And so Christ pass one cup and they share from that one cup symbolizing union with him. There's some denominations that take this also very literally. They would look at our practice, you know, of passing out many cups and they would say, oh, you guys are so wrong on that. Many years ago, I was in Tanzania, East Africa on a Sunday morning. I went to a Moravian church. The Moravians are one cuppers. So at this church on a Sunday morning, sitting at the back because I don't necessarily fit in, it was communion Sunday, and at the very front, the the priest of the church or the preacher, he had the elements out. He had one cup and one piece of bread. Since I was new... I'm watching to see what happens, you know, because you don't want to look like you don't know what you're doing in church on a Sunday morning, right? It's an awkward position. So people get up, the first row goes up, and the priest at the front breaks bread, puts it in their mouth, and then he takes the cup of wine, and he puts it on their lip and pours it. Now, I'm doing the same thing that Tiffany Rogers is doing. I'm thinking, uh, oh, no, <laughs> you know? We're all going to share from that, you know? I, I, I pray to God there's no backwash in the, the one cup. I remember sitting there in my little, you know, chair, thinking about all the communicable diseases that go around East Africa, and I'm saying, Lord, I know this is your body and blood, but all I can think about right now is tuberculosis and E. coli and typhoid. Help me, Jesus, to take this in a worthy manner that thinks about your sacrifice and not disease. Amen. (laughs) So I went to the front, and I took it like everybody else. I checked myself three months later (laughs) for TB, and praise God, I don't have tuberculosis. Now, Do we have to have necessarily one cup? Well, not necessarily. The point is what that cup symbolizes. What does it symbolize? Symbolize Christ's blood shed for us. Verse 24, the Passover ritual is giving way to the new reality of God's deliverance in Christ. So if you have the old covenant here, what is it doing? It's pointing that way. Christ is right here saying, This is the reality. Jesus will speak of the wine and he will say, this blood is, uh, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. The blood of the covenant. 
the apostles in that room, when they heard that phrase, the blood of the covenant, their minds would have instantly gone back to Exodus 24. Maybe there's a footnote in your Bible. Exodus 24, verses 6 through 8. You see, after God brings his people out of Israel, after Passover is celebrated, God forms a relationship with his people called the covenant in which Moses brings the people of God to Mount Sinai and he sprinkles blood on them. Why? There was a sacrifice that happened that had to happen to free the people of God. Exodus 24, 8 reads this. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Can you imagine what that would have been like? I know we want to wear our Sunday best to church, but on that day, (laughs) can I wear my painter's clothes? We're going to get bloody. Got to be ready for it. Jesus is forming the new covenant with his blood with the people of God. In Luke's account of the Last Supper, Luke chapter 22, verse 20, Jesus will say this, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. New covenant. Highly important. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. Jeremiah the prophet anticipates God is going to do something new among you different among you. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, And I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity. And I will remember their sin no more. The old covenant was a covenant of works. God had given his law. In order for the people of God to maintain a relationship with God, they needed to do the law. Of course, you see the inherent problem. We can't do it. Why? Because we're sinful. The new covenant that Jeremiah is looking forward to is a covenant in which God takes his word and he puts it in us. In which he takes believing heart of faith and regenerates us. The people were to depend upon works. They were in trouble. The law ended up condemning the people of God. It didn't give them freedom. What they needed was grace. And that's what the new covenant is pointing to. The grace of God given in Christ to sinners like us who need him desperately. Finally, we note that the blood of the covenant is poured out for many, for many. And again, if you were a Jew and you were in that room and you heard poured out for many, your mind would instantly go to Isaiah Chapter 53 and verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Why? Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for their transgressors. Mark 10, 45, the thesis of the whole gospel is this. The Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The writer of Hebrews will tell us it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. All the sacrifices in the Old Testament, their value was in as much as they pointed to 
the ultimate sacrifice of Christ. You see, sin results in two things. It results, first of all, in the wrath of God. For God to be good, for God to be holy, He cannot tolerate sin. Otherwise, He's not good and He's not holy. Sin must be dealt with. Christ deals with sin for us when He gives His body and His blood for us. Sin also creates something else, and I think you know this. I don't have to tell you, but I will. Sin creates guilt. It creates guilt. When you do what you know you shouldn't do, what happens in your heart? If God's Spirit is working in you, you feel the weight of it. You feel guilt. And that must be dealt with. And how is it dealt with? Only Christ can remove your guilt. He's come to ransom a people for himself. He's come to satisfy the wrath of God. And he's come to take care of your guilt problem. Friends, sin is weighty. It's a big deal. The only answer to the problem of sin is the death of the Son of God. The one that we assault when we sin is infinite, God. Therefore, an infinite sacrifice must be made, the God-man. You see, I, I think until we really understand the weightiness of sin, we'll never fully appreciate its awful character. And we'll think of sin as something small. Well, you know, I mean, everybody does this after all. I'll go ahead and do it. Or, you know what, it's just just one time. It's not that big of a deal. When we give in to the temptation, we give in to the devil, our own sinful flesh, by thinking that sin is just not that big of a deal, then we're treating Christ's sacrifice as if it is not that big of a deal. Friends, don't take sin lightly. So let me prompt you to ask some questions. Are you haunted by guilt for the things that you've done in the past? Are you afraid of the the judgment of God? The answer to either one of these is yes. Yes then let me say good news. There's an answer. Only one. Jesus Christ is spiritually with us. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper to supply the greatest need that we have, which is the need for grace. Okay, we've looked at the already and we've spent most of our time there five minutes, we'll wrap up the knot yet. Okay. Mark 14, verses 25 and 26. Read with me. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The meal ends with Jesus' solemn declaration, I'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine again until the kingdom of God comes. The kingdom of God is a transition between the already and the not yet. It begins, it's inaugurated in Christ's earthly ministry. It's consummated at His second coming. It is both already and not yet. The looking forward to eating one final meal also pictures in the minds of Jews, and if you've read your Bible, our minds, the messianic feast at the end of the age. When Christ comes again, it's going to be like a banquet. We're both believing Jews and believing Gentiles that together compose the new people of God, the church, when they come to the table and they celebrate with their Lord. Paul will say this in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. 
For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, until he comes. The Lord's Supper connects us to what Christ has already done. The Lord's Supper anticipates what Christ will do when he comes again in glory. This morning we're looking two directions at the same time. We're looking back. We're looking forward. Verse 26 of our text closes with the disciples going to the foothills of the Mount of Olives. Perhaps they sang a hymn on their way. Perhaps it was one of the Hallel Psalms. This morning as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, I'm going to read Psalm 118, verses 17 through 24. I would ask the servers if you guys would come forward while I read. We will pass the elements out, and then we will take them as one body. So hold the elements, we'll take them at the same time. Psalm 118, I shall not die, but I shall live. And recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
Christian, the body of Christ that is broken for you, do this in the remembrance of Jesus. Believers, the blood of Christ that is shed for you, take away your sin.